Thank you so much to everyone for being here today. This is um, our first ever digital sector roundtable um, under the Young Africa Works project um, between Jobberman um, and obviously in partnership with the MasterCard Foundation, um, whose project, whose umbrella project it is. So excited to partner with the MasterCard Foundation on this. Um, and um, you can go to the next slide, Alor. So just uh, in terms of housekeeping, um, we have included the link for the Zoom meeting on the first slide, just in case any of you may have missed it or if you want to share it with anyone um, who isn't here. Um, this is the link, feel free to share it with other people as well. Um, moving on to the next slide, the agenda for the day and what we have planned. I think you had seen this in the actual registration link on the landing page. So just starting from the top, um, we have the introduction, welcome remarks um, by Hilda Kabushenga Praga. Um, and we'll be going into each of these individuals and their titles um, as we have a specific slot for them um, in our presentation. Um, and you'll be getting to know them quite well. Then we have the Yao context and the digital economy by um, Aisata So. Um, then remarks on information technology in Nigeria. Um, Barrister Kasim A. Sodangi, he is representing um, the DG of NITA, who unfortunately um, informed us last night that he wouldn't be able to attend, but he kindly sent someone to represent him. Then presenting findings from the Digital Sector Skills Gap Report, Femi Balogun. Then um, the Q&A session and the polls regarding discussing the report findings um, from my end, Amanda Potelo Akoni. Um, if I hadn't introduced myself, that is who I am, Amanda Potelo Akoni. And then uh, moving into the panel session, um, here, this will be moderated by Mayowa Ali. And then after that breakout sessions, we have uh, Mayowa Ali, Nisi Madu, and Adaze Sokan, who will be our moderators for that. And then afterwards, they will share the, um, I guess, findings or what was discussed during those breakout sessions. And then finally, we'll close uh, with the next steps and closing remarks by Hilda Kabushenga Praga. So that's basically a run through of what we have today, but we think this is going to be a robust and um, exciting discussion. We hope that it will start a conversation that will hopefully turn into some um, initiatives or next steps that we can take as a collective to fully realize the potential of the digital sector in Nigeria. So moving on to our first speaker, um, Hilda, um, for the introduction and welcome remarks, we have Hilda Kabushenga Kraga. She is the MD of Rome Africa Jobs, uh, which is essentially the parent company of Jobberman Nigeria. Um, and she is, we thought, who better than her to give us the welcome remarks. So Hilda, over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you for everybody who's here. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. I've been having bandwidth issues all morning, but we will make it work. Um, uh, I think just first of all, I'm a company and we run the leading jobs platforms all across Africa. German in particular is the leading uh, number one recruitment platform in Nigeria with over 2 million candidates and I think now up to 70,000 employers. And we deal especially with young people. So I think 60% of our demographic is between the ages of 26 and, and, and 40 years old. And our fastest growing demographic is young fresh graduates right out of university, which means that for us, um, the issue of youth unemployment becomes very close to our heart because it's core to our mission. We cannot fulfill our mission as a company if we're not tackling the underlying issues um, around yeah, youth, youth unemployment and youth engagement. Um, I think just digging a bit deeper into Young um, Africa Works and Young Nigerian Work, Young Nigeria Works as well. In 2020, we partnered with the MasterCard Foundation to tackle youth unemployment in Nigeria and specifically focusing on Lagos, Kano and Kaduna and as well as the, create, the digital, creative and agriculture, agriculture um, sectors. This particular round table is focused on, on digital. I think one of the things we hope to do next year and we will do next year is to have more such engagements around the other sectors as well as we, as we do the work. We've spent a lot of this year um, deep diving into the digital sector, of course, accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic where overnight everybody was forced to go digital or begin the, the migration to digital. And what we found is that even though, even though it's, there's a need for us to be increasingly be moving in this direction, as a country, especially for young people, we're still woefully underprepared. So we're living in a, in a place where if you've read through the report, you know, only about, only about two to 4% of young people are actually equipped 
for work by the time they graduate and up to 20% need further interventions, especially in the area of digital. So we hope that through this discourse and through this report and such similar reports, we'll get to a place where we can think about practical solutions for the Nigerian market, for young people in Nigeria to embrace the global digital economy and to in, in, improve their work uh, in forestry and it's looking forward to this um, very, very interesting discourse for the next two hours. Thank you. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Hilda. Um, I think you've painted the picture so well of how this all fits into our project. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think then without any further ado, we'll move on to um, our next speaker. And essentially our next speaker is actually a representative from the MasterCard Foundation. Um, this is um, Isata So, she's a country program lead and digital technology lead for the MasterCard Foundation. Um, and she'll basically be providing us with the young, um, I guess, young Africa works context in terms of uh, the digital sector, um, uh, as that is one of the three focus sectors as Hilda has mentioned um, of the Young Africa Works Project and the importance of the digital economy. Um, uh, I sat to just shared uh, a bit of context um, with us, uh, I guess, about herself in terms of the involvement of the work that um, she has done. And, and I guess for her, it's been a long career in international development, um, uh, starting from her studies and embarking on a 15 year long career, um, moving from the Gori Institute in Senegal, joining the George Soros Open Society Foundation as permanent consultant, um, and then of course, moving to Chief of Operations for the African Virtual University. This eventually led her to join ACORD UK as partnerships advisor, um, uh, and this is based in London, and then eventually brought her to the MasterCard Foundation in March, 2019. So she's leading the digital economy programs for West and Central Africa, and also managing the Nigeria country programs. Um, this is something that she feels very passionate about, um, and we thought it would help to get that context from the MasterCard Foundation, but also from someone who has uh, a vested interest um, in this specific sector, um, and uh, one that is transforming the African continent and Nigeria as well. Um, so thank you so much, Isata, for being here today. And we look forward um, to hearing your address um, uh, on this specific topic. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Hilda, and um, everyone at the at Jobaman. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, sometimes you talk about me, I'm just like, is it really me that you're describing there? <laughs> but very humbly, I want to thank you for this opportunity to represent the MasterCard Foundation uh, at this uh, Nigeria Digital Sector Skills Roundtable. Um, so just to give a few background on the on the foundation. Um, we are um, probably now one of the largest private foundation in the world. We were established by MasterCard company in, in, 26, in 2006, but we are an independent organization with its own board of directors and, and management. And our main mission is to work to enable young people in Africa and in indigenous communities in Canada to access dignified and fulfilling work. And uh, we do work with partners like you. We uh, have a target which is quite ambitious of 30 million young people, especially young women across Africa, to be able to access uh, dignified work. As you know, Africa is home to the largest workforce uh, around the world. There's close to 400 million people that will be entering the job market by 2030. If they're given the right skills, we believe that these young people will contribute to Africa's global effort for economic development. Uh, we also um, believe that they will contribute to creating a more inclusive and equitable world. Um, our strategy, Young Africa Works, is um, based on 10, on 10 countries, well, seven countries that we're working on now. And that strategy is to uh, particularly uh, enable young people in Africa, as I said, to access dignified and fulfilling work. And um, we, uh, we are also uh, 
like partnering with um sorry i'm just trying to find my my notes here with the screen so we engage with countries also to better understand their economic aspirations and to identify priority sectors for growth so as you mentioned some of the priority sectors for example that we have in nigeria is agriculture creative industries um, education of course and finance that is cutting across um, and um, and of course digital and in nigeria uh, we are building on the existing uh, vibrant and entrepreneurial culture to create economic opportunities for young people in Nigeria. We have a target in Nigeria of 10 million young people to have access to dignified work. Now, it may seem big, but actually Nigeria is a young, diverse and dynamic country that abounds with potential and with opportunities. We have roughly half of like 200 million people living in Nigeria who are between the age <clears throat> of 15 and 24. And 70% of that population is of the population is under 30 years old. And yet youth employment poses a significant threat as it is to Nigeria's economic prospect and to Nigeria's development. We have an unemployment rate that is at 18% overall, but the youth unemployment rate itself is nearly double that at 33%. And we know that three, three out of 10 Africans who are entering the labor market today annually are Nigerians. So our approach is to deliver interventions and partnerships that will tap into that entrepreneurship culture, into the incredible sizable private sector that is existing in Nigeria uh, and connect over 2 million young people to opportunities over the next five years. And we're starting that with three main states where we have the biggest concentration of young people in Nigeria, that is in coming from the north in Kano, Kaduna and Lagos. But it is not just limited to, to, to that. So how does a foundation assess the potential of the digital economy or digital transformation to create jobs and work opportunities for young people? It is undeniable that digital transformation has unlocked gains for African economies, but they are not evenly distributed across the board. There are still many barriers to equity, um, in access, to inclusion, and in part this is due to the digital skills gap that is contributing to low digital inclusion rates for young men and women. And we have additional barriers of course related to uh, especially geographical location, so for youth in rural areas, for women, for refugees, uh, for internal, internally displaced people, or people living with disability, um, they will face barriers in terms of access to internet, connectivity, and availability of affordable devices. And there lies the Africa paradox, because digital technologies have always been linked to economic growth. Research has shown that there is a direct correlation between increased digital, uh, increased, increased digital uh, penetration and economic growth. The more people use technology in a, in a country, the more there is economic growth. Digital adoption fosters growth and productivity it contributes to that greater inclusion because it lowers transaction costs, it addresses information asymmetries, it boosts economies of, state, of, uh, of scale. And adoption and usage of technologies contribute also to the proliferation of new business model, some of which are innovative business models and solutions for previously highly fragmented and very localized and inefficient sometimes value chains. So the foundation um, supports the belief that African economies can build wealth faster and in a more sustainable way if they embrace the potential of digital innovations and technologies. How does it link to job and work creation? The world's 10 most in-demand job in 2020 and 2021 are digital jobs linked to coding, to AI, um, to data science, and servicing numerous economic sectors, from health to education, to transport, to creative industries. And at the same time, at worldwide level, 
there is a shortage of advanced digital skills. If you train today in African on all of these aspects that I previously mentioned, we know that they will get immediately hired wherever in the world. So the, that also like creates demand um, and extraction of our, of our brain industry, of our brain, young brains. <clears throat> And in Africa, we know our economies are also transforming at various pace, yes, but they need more and more local homegrown tech enterprises that are able to develop and provide digital solutions that fit our context and our challenges. And in that transformation lies a huge potential for young people to acquire the right skills and then service the demand from private sector or from government or, con or consumers. So going forward, we will be focusing on three main enablers of job creation and growth. The first one is digital skills. We will equip young people with digital skills to improve their employability and job creation. Uh, the second one is digital platforms, um, expand work opportunities offered by this new gig economy and by the digitization of services through online platform across sectors and their value chain in agriculture, in financial services, in health, in retail. And the last one, not the least, is digital entrepreneurship. Promote digital entrepreneurship and foster an ecosystem that supports firms to generate disruptive new products and services by leveraging technologies and business models that ultimately will proliferate dignified work. And by doing so, we believe that we will have the potential to even exceed our 30 million target goal for Africa and the 10 million that we have in Nigeria and catalyze multiple positive impacts. Um, we are extremely proud to work with Jobberman on a project that actually builds on an existing service, on existing technological capabilities and network to enable the broader range of young people, including young women in the, in the north of Nigeria, to be linked to work opportunities faster and at scale. So this partnership intervention brings visibility, it brings transparency, efficiency into markets to ensure that all young work seekers have equal access to the right opportunities and that employers secure and match the right person for roles that they have and thereby increase their own firm level productivity and drive job creating economic growth. We, um, we know that Jobberman is conducting this skills gap um, analysis to determine employer skills need and provide fit for purpose data that informs education and training systems to prepare youth for work. So we thank you again for this opportunity to represent the MasterCard Foundation. And I can't wait to hear about the findings from the digital sector skills gap research. And um, so I will pass it again over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Aisata. Um, I think you laid the, or, you know, provided context for us from the foundation's perspective. Um, and also, you know, the importance of the sector for us and even the levers you are looking to pull and focus on um, to achieve the impact uh, in vision. So thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. All right. So now that we have um, received that perspective, um, we thought it was important to get perspective from a key stakeholder within the information technology um, space in Nigeria, that is NITDA. Um, and um, here with us today, representing uh, the DG of NITDA is Mr. Kasim Sodangi. Um, so just brief context on um, Mr. Kasim Sodangi. He's a lawyer with experience spanning intellectual property, project management and finance. He served as head strategic alliances at Superbrands Nigeria, um, and uh, which is where he inducted 40 of West Africa's leading brands into the global super brands program. Um, started his career at Law Alliance um, and then shifted from there, um, or rather shifted from there to being head public sector and upcountry operations for CBO Capital Partners, a boutique investment house in Lagos. Um, he is a graduate of Amadou Bello University, Zaria, and the Nigerian Law School. And he's currently the national coordinator for the office 
for the Nigeria Content Development in ICT, ONC of NITA. Um, so hence he's representing the DG of NITA today. In this role, he oversees NITA's effort in driving the development of local capacities in ICT in Nigeria. Um, he also supports other regulatory functions of the agency. So um, Mr. Kasim Sodangi, thank you so much for being with us here today, sir, especially at such short notice. We don't take it for granted. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be on this session. Um, first to read the DG's address and then eventually participate in the conversations, um, very critical conversations that um, that have that I've concerned to NIDA and even as, at, at my in my office. Um, these are issues we've tried to grapple with, and it'll just be fantastic to um, talk with everyone in this room, listen to perspectives, and then see how we could uh, build better platforms and collaborate even more widely to be able to achieve some of these um, objectives, which are critical. I mean, um, um, ISAT has, has, has laid a beautiful foundation just on the challenges. So I'll try and avoid some of the other sort of detailed statistics she's provided, but I'll go into, um, I'll go through the DG's address. He, the Director General made, uh, had an, has an address. Uh, so I'll read faithfully um, and just make some comments along the way on his address. And then hopefully during the discussions later in the day, when we've listened to the report, I can uh, make some inputs on where we're going, what are the challenges we see, and sort of from the perspective of government, what we need to do. So um, good morning again from the Director General. As you've um, rightfully, right, you rightly explained, he's unavoidably absent and he wanted to be here in person, but um, I'll try and <clears throat> just read his thoughts and then um, try and articulate again his position so that we make um, some informed uh, suggestions and contributions to the meeting. So his theme is harnessing the growth and opportunities of the digital sector and bridging the skill gap in Nigeria. Um, the, the Nigerian digital sector is one of the top contributors to the gross domestic product. Our 17.83% of GDP in the second quarter 2020, and equally one of the vibrant and fastest growing sectors in Nigeria. According to a report of the Startup Genome, Nigeria has about 6,500 digital innovation registered businesses worth over 2 billion US dollars. A 2019 report by the Center for Global Development um, commenting on Nigeria's digital entrepreneurship landscape indicates that large, firm, large digital firms deliver services in healthcare, agriculture, finance, that is fintech, while other smaller firms also, also provide services around e-commerce and other re retail related services. Additionally, a, um, a Q1 2020 statistics on Nigeria by LinkedIn, um, covering 4 million active Nigerians on the platform and 49,000 companies and 28,000 standardized skills indicates that an industry breakdown of Nigerians on the platform should corporate services, finance, education, and software and IT services as the four, um, top most sectors employing Nigerians, Nigerians registered on the platform. This data, while not fully representative of Niger Nigerian employment landscape, is significantly relevant to understanding the opportunities in the services sector in Nigeria, just as um, has, been, has been discussed or has been elaborated on, and just the opportunities it brings or it gives Nigeria. Des despite the economic growth potential and availability of opportunities in the space, the Nigerian digital ecosystem has peculiar challenges, not unlike any other digital tech ecosystem around the world. One of the challenges hampering the Nigerian digital technology tech ecosystem is the lack of talents or the shortage of talents more so, but mainly a shortfall. It's not, the, sorry, I'll take that again. One of the challenges hampering the Nigerian digital tech ecosystem is not the lack of talents, but mainly a shortfall of the digital skill sets required for gainful employment and building a globally competitive ecosystem to adequately harness the opportunities provided by the sector. Available statistics indicate an annual estimated enrollment population of about 2 million into 308 degree awarding institutions, 174 universities and 134 polytechnics to be specific in Nigeria and about 600,000 graduates annually with less than 2% having useful digital skills. Furthermore, Despite the economic contribution potential 
of the software industry as evidenced in other clients across the world. Nigeria has an estimated 85,000, about 0.24 of non-agricultural labor force, has estimate an estimate of only about 85,000 um, of the estimated 700,000 professional software developers across the African continent, as highlighted by the 2020 Economy Africa report. I guess that report was developed at the instance of Google. This, this figure, 85,000 represents only about 0.24 of the non-agricultural labor force in, um, in Africa. The, the report further indicates, indicated Lagos, Abuja, and Benin City as the top locations for developers. About 77% of the developer population gained their skills via informal education channels, as indicated by the report. This clearly highlights the existing skill gaps and the need for concerted effort to upskill capacity development for digital skills in Nigeria. To address these challenges, the National Digital Economy Policy and Strategy was launched to reposition and rapidly develop the Nigerian econ digital economy by harnessing the many opportunities and growth potentials provided by the digital technology sector. The, the policy is anchored on eight pillars, namely developmental regulation, digital skills, digital literacy and skills, solid infrastructure, digital services, development and promotion, soft infrastructure, digital society and emerging technologies and indigenous content development and adoption. The eight pillars of the policy are designed and targeted at addressing the identified gaps in harnessing the vast potentials and opportunities available in the digital technology sector for job creation and inclusive economic growth. In view of the relatively low digital literacy in Nigeria, as suggested by available data on technology adoption, financial inclusion, and broadband penetration in rural areas, and the necessity of human capital to the development of a vibrant digital economy. Pillar two, digital literacy and skills of the policy is targeted at building a critical mass of digital literacy and cutting and cutting edge digital skills to close identified gaps and adequately, adequately prepare Nigeria for impending fourth industrial revolution and enable Nigerians harness digital technologies for employment and wealth creation. Additionally, Pillar five, digital service development and promotion is focused on developing a vibrant and competitive digital ecosystem that supports and engenders innovation in, in innovative driven enterprises, IDEs, and micro, small, and medium enterprises. A 2019 report by the Small and Medium Enterprises Development Agency of Nigeria, SMEDAN, showed that 96% of all the business activities in Nigeria are conducted by MSMEs with 90% falling under the micro category. As such, pillar five of the, in, the, the policy, digital economy policy would integrate innovation into the uh, MSME structure to create digital driven SMEs as a bridge to developing a pool of innovation driven enterprises to provide job creation and opportunities for Nigeria. Furthermore, pillar seven, digital society and emerging technologies focuses on ensuring that Nigeria attains the seventh sustainable development goal that are most relevant to digital economy, namely poverty eradication, good health and well-being, quality education, decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation and infrastructure, reducing inequality, and sustainable cities and communities. The pillar will explore the use of emerging technologies to address national challenges and create a digital innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem that will stimulate development of innovative ventures. Pillar eight, indigenous content development and ad adoption of the policy focus, focus on promoting and adopting indigenous content to enable Nigeria benefit from the global technology market. The target here is to make Nigeria a global outsourcing hub for digital jobs. Deliberate strategies will be implemented to ensure that digital jobs are outsourced to economic disadvantaged areas to improve their economic, their economic conditions. As the agency of government mandated to regulate the digital economy space, the National Information Technology Development Agency has designed some strategic interventions and, the pro and programs to address some of the challenges bedeviling the digital technology ecosystem, create opportunities for citizens and ensure steady growth of the tech ecosystem in Nigeria. The NIDA Academy for Research and Training NAT, an online education platform was launched to bridge the widening 
digital skill gap, increase employability of Nigerians, reduce the unemployment rate, as well as promote inclusive ICT-driven society in line with the policy. Over 30,000 Nigerians have so far been trained in various digital skills on the platform. NIDA has also inaugurated a 10-man advisory committee on the impact of COVID-19 on the technology and innovation ecosystem, Tech for COVID, to advise the Nigerian government on measures to cushion the economic impact of the pandemic on the technology ecosystem. The committee has since submitted its recommendation on suitable strategies to address the challenges identified in four key areas, business continuity, funding, policy, and hubs. The recommendations of the Tech for COVID-19 committee are currently being implemented to support and sustain the digital technology ecosystem considering the ravaging effects of COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, NIDA designed the Technology Innovation and Entrepreneurship Support Scheme as a capacity building program for hub managers, technology startups, and young Nigerians to ensure massive creation of digital entrepreneurs, spur digital job creation and economic growth in Nigeria. The TAI scheme, that's the acronym, mainly covers hub upskilling, hub managers training, hub upskilling, which is hub managers training, technical skills, that's software development, um, and other ancillary skills, incubation, entrepreneurial skills, which is entrepreneurial skills, and then internships. These are some of the strategic interventions of NIDA aimed at bridging the skill gaps and enabling Nigerians harness the many opportunities available in the digital technology sector. In a research on the Nigerian software ecosystem, in a research, sorry, I'll take that again, in a research on the Nigerian software ecosystem, it indicated that Nigerian software market is estimated around 6 billion US dollars if developed to its full, full potential. The research further highlighted that enterprise software vendors will greatly benefit from the growing investments in modern IT infrastructure by government and large businesses in Nigeria. Additionally, language and time zone offers Nigeria great advantage as a potential outsourcing hub for lucrative markets around the world. Therefore, if IT enables services, business process outsourcing has the potential to create huge economic growth and job opportunities for Nigeria. It is in consideration of this fact that the draft national outsourcing strategy was developed by NIDA. The strategy aims to deliver 1 million jobs in Nigeria by 2025 and is anchored on seven critical pillars, infrastructure, skill and human capacity development, branding and promotion, finance and incentives, innovation and entrepreneurship, trust, privacy, and security, and multi-stakeholder governance. Finally, design strategy, as well as consolidate stakeholder efforts to fully achieve the objectives of the digital economy policy for a digital Nigeria. We anticipate an upsurge in opportunities and upskilling of digital capacities in Nigeria. Therefore, we look forward to the recommendations from this session that will assist us in consolidating the gains recorded so far. This is the address of um, the, the DG. Um, hopefully during the sessions, as we move forward, we'll have opportunity to discuss some of these in more detail and just see what catalytic ideas we can harness to um, create platforms that would enable the jobs. Clearly MasterCard is, um, doing fantastically with, with and leading the charge in its partnerships and the role it's playing in Nigeria. We appreciate that greatly. And it'll be interesting to see what conversations can happen from the policy perspective. And again, uh, public-private pa partnerships to see what we can deliver in job creation and so on. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I look forward to um, all the conversations. I will certainly relay them back in my report and then also participate in the conversations as they occur. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you so much, Mr. Kasim Sodangi. Um, wow, it is it is so encouraging to just hear the well thought out strategy um, that NITA has, the various pillars that you have mentioned, and even the different sections that you want to focus on, which um, I think tie in perfectly with some of the breakout sessions we'll be having from um, business process outsourcing um, to looking at digital talent, um, thank you so much, sir. And I think you've touched on something so important, the private-public private -public partnerships and the importance of that. Um, and I, I think us, for us as well, we look forward to seeing that um, coming out of this session. So thank you, sir. All right. Um, 
so I think that uh, basically um, uh, gives us a, a great overview of information technology in Nigeria and ties into what um, you know the overall discussion um, we're having here at this round table. Um, and I think with moving on to the next section is presenting the findings from the digital sector digital skills gap reports. Um, and essentially, as the title of the digital sector roundtable is harnessing the growth opportunities of the digital sector and bridging the skills gap. I'll be handing over to Femi Balogun. He's the monitoring and evaluations lead or specialist at Jobberman. And he'll be sharing with us a brief um, uh, synopsis of the findings. Please note that we will be sharing the report with everyone separately after this event. Um, it is quite a long report, but we tried to pull out key findings. Over to you, Femi. Thank you very much, um, uh, Hilda, for, for this. Um, before I go on, let me just stand on protocols and um, recognize uh, Mr. Kash Kash Kashifu Inua Abdullahi, DG of NITA, um, represented by Barrister Kashim um, Sadugi, um, Aisha Tussaud, um, representative from the MasterCard Foundation, um, public and private sector players, development partners, NGO civil society colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and wel welcome to um, this digital sector roundtable again. Um, I want to begin by saying that Nigeria is, and indeed Africa, um, you know, we're in a very interesting time. And, and I say that, you know, in a very positive sense, because for Nigeria, we, 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 are, we have a pathway. The digital sector presents you know, a unique pathway um, for inclusive prosperity um, um, for everyone. And, you know, and this is you know, already beginning, we're seeing the signs already in macroeconomic indicators, you know, like, like our GDP and, and, and all of that. And this is very interesting because with, a, with just a mobile phone or a laptop, every young person, every young person in the country can actually, you know, um, get a job or be an employer. Um, and but all we just need to do, you know, is to ensure that young people have can access mobile phones. And so the question is, can we make it cheap? How, how can we also help them build skills to create content online and also, you know, provide services online that can create uh, income for them? And also, how can we, you know, create or provide uh, um, stable electricity? How can we improve internet penetration and the quality of internet service? And how can we also remove this, the policies that um, restrict innovation and entrepreneurship? And I just decided to front load, you know, um, my, you know, the general position here and some of the questions. Um, and recommendations that are already emerging here. Um, because I think, you know, this is a, a really, really huge, the digital sector presents really huge um, opportunity for, for economic um, recovery. And this rapid digital transformation, as we can see, is already, you know, shaping, um, you know, shaping global economies and Nigeria. And, you know, experts are already beginning to say that Nigeria is in a vantage position to reap these benefits. Already Nigeria is, um, um, you know, the foremost destination for investment in, on the continent. You know, we have the, uh, the, the Nigeria's ICT sector is already leading in terms of its contribution to national GDP, even uh, beyond oil. And, you know, this, this potential is apparent. Um, it's undeniable, you know, talking about Nigeria being the foremost des destination for investment on the continent, venture capital reached an all-time high of $660 million um, in 2019. And, and although in 2020, um, you know, due to the pandemic, we are seeing, you know, some slide in, in this investment. We are also seeing that healthcare, health tech startups in Nigeria are, be, are you know, beginning to receive the largest rounds of, of funding, um, especially as data provided by um, Brita Bridges, you know, in the second quarter of, of 2020. And we're seeing, you know, startups such as uh, 
FIFO Gini and, and Helium Health receiving, you know, uh, 15 million and 10 million um, um, US dollars respectively. And, you know, there's an increasing sense that, you know, investors are willing to make big, big bets, you know, in Nigeria and indeed across, across Africa. You know, um, it was interesting to see the news, you know, recently um, hearing that Stripe acquired Paystack for a whooping 200 million um, US dollars. And this speaks to the growing influence and prospect that the Nigerian um, digital sector, you know, um, possesses. Experts are also estimating that the digital sector um, within the next 10 years can contribute $88 billion to the economy and, and that the digital sector can actually potentially contribute 3 million jobs by 2027. And in, your, in a very um, you know, conservative estimate um, done by uh, our partners on, the, on, on this um, round table, Traction, uh, partner, uh, venture partners, you know, the estimates suggest that these jobs will be created, you know, across three um, levels of specialization. You know, we have between 600 to 700,000 jobs that can be created in highly specialized jobs. And these highly specialized jobs um, are those kind of jobs that require um, advanced education, um, such as software development, the software developers, data scientists, you know, designers. And at another level, uh, between 300 to 400,000 jobs can be, you know, um, created within gen generalist and BPO roles. Um, and these are, you know, jobs that require, you know, higher education, but not necessarily even technology focused um, uh, uh, training. And these are like, you know, these are jobs like call center operators, you know, data entry specialists and the likes. And, you know, the biggest area where, um, there, there's a huge opportunity is even in tech and enabled jobs, you know, and this, you know, constitute roles um, created due to, you know, technology like, you know, delivery drivers, you know, um, financial agents and the like. And, you know, this, the job, this description, you know, it's, it's, it's not inclusive of the jobs that can also be created within FinTech, health tech, agri tech, and the, and the, and the likes. Um, However, what is important to also note is, or the question to ask is, what, what is, you know, uh, um, what is driving this demand for digital skills, you know? And what we found is, you know, the technology, the technological drivers, and there are also uh, um, changes in the demographics and, and social economic drivers, you know, um, that are leading to these, you know, changes within um, the digital sector. When we talk about, you know, the penetration of mobile internet, like we talk, talked about advancement in computer power, in computing power and big data, AI and machine learning, the internet of things. And also interesting, you know, if, um, um, it, you know, uh, trends within the demographic and social economic drivers, you know, like we mentioned urbanization and increasing um, youth population, um, increasing concerns about climate change and you know environmental sustainability, for instance, is um, influencing the the demand for digital skills. Because you know when we talk about climate change, when we talk about environmental sustainability, everybody's now thinking how can we use you know technology to solve um, some of this problem. There's also the issues around um, you know safety, online safety, and then also the increasing uh, concerns, increasing concerns. Um, for you know the the, the involvement of, of women within uh, the digital the digital sector. Now the increasing latent potential of Nigeria's digital sector and its attractiveness to investors is in part underpinned by um, emerging if five key emerging trends and you know, we've just highlighted a few of, of, of them and I just want to speak uh, in a bit of more detail. So when we talk about urbanization, for instance, Nigeria's, Nigeria's population is on the brink of, of, a, of, of a, uh, uh, an urban revolution. You know, we, we have a population estimated at 200 million and about more than half of that population are between ages 15 and, and 35. And, you know, many of who are, um, are, are tech savvy. 
Now, the, the population growth is, this population growth is, is, is occurring side by side um, with urbanization, and this is advancing um, growth in con consumer ex in exp expenditure. Many young people, you know, migrating from rural to urban areas, for instance, are being brought in close proximity with new technology, improved opportunities for employment, as well as the increasing prospect for, for entrepreneurship or, or even self-employment. And we are seeing, you know, um, that a lot of these opportunities are within the informal sector and which is even really difficult to um, capture because of the paucity of, of, of data. And also the, the democratic, you know, this demographic shift is, you know, meaningfully ad, ad advancing con consumption patterns as young people are becoming more and more um, shaped by globalization and, and it's gr is growing um, um, affluence. When we talk about mobile penetration, and this is where, you know, um, becomes very interesting. Nigeria's internet subs subscribers have grown from over, from just 200,000 in year 2000 to over 126 million in 2020. Um, and with a 61% um, 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 penetration. This is according to the internet world stats. Now a similar analysis by, by GSME suggests that Nigeria has, you know, over 97 million uh, unique mobile subscribers with a 49% penetration, which is expected to rise, you know, to 55% by 2025. And from a continental perspective, you know, from a continental um, pers uh, perspective, the research uh, done by the IFC and Google, you know, suggests that increasing internet penetration by, by 10% can potentially increase GDP per capita by 2.5. At 2.5%, while increasing internet access to 75%, which is you know the the audacious goal by um, um, by by the by the government can actually create 44 um, million jobs across across the continent. And so what this means is that you know the mobile that mobile technology essentially provides or presents an array of opportunities for businesses and economic growth. Um, although affordability remains um, a barrier. And that's why I said at the beginning that, you know, how can we make, you know, mobile, uh, mobile or mobile smartphones, you know, cheaper? And how can we make internet accessible and, you know, uh, a bit more affordable? You know, the, so when we talk about um, how COVID is, you know, is shaping this the pandemic, you know, may have accelerated the uptake of technology, you know, in particular with leading to an increased appreciation um, of the necessity and value for tech-based solution in businesses, you know, learning activities, religious activities, as well as other forms of social interaction. We are seeing how the, um, the entertainment industry is now, you know, innovating um, using technology as a result of COVID to um, push out content and also engage you know, some of their followers and clients, um, even within um, the pandemic and, you know, development also in, in you know, and also the development in computing data, you know, has also increased as a result of um, uh, and COVID. And then there's, a, you know, an increasing realization that um, being online is perhaps a new, uh, the new normal, like we say. Now the fourth industrial revolution, and an important you know trend um, in terms of development in AI and machine learning, peer-to-peer -peer platforms and manufacturing technology, you know, is in, is as you know is making routine tasks you know a bit uh, re routine tasks a bit re redundant. I was you know uh, reflecting on some of the findings and. Um, there were a group of lawyers who, um, there was a test between the group of lawyers and what AI can do. And so they were looking at 95 documents and trying to get, uh, find loopholes in some of these legal documents. AI was able to, you know, find those loopholes within 22 seconds, right? And, but lawyers, but the lawyers could only, you know, find the gaps within this document within uh, um, over an, in, within an hour, right? And so this, 
you know, should not make us afraid, but you show us, you know, the potential that the fourth industrial revolution um, is going to bring to, to our economies. And according to the World Economic Forum, um, the, the a recent report by, by the World Economic Forum estimates that 46% of work activities in Nigeria will be susceptible to um, automation. And some of the new you know, job functions that will emerge include process automation, um, digital marketing, you know, human and machine intera interaction designers, logistics experts, geologists, mining engineers, you know, as well as AI and machine uh, learning experts, you know, and the increasing trend also, you know, we cannot, um, um, you know, undermine the influence of, of, you know, what policy and improved business environment, um, you know, has contributed to, um, this 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 improvement within the digital sector, you know, point you know, um, an important you know point to note is um, recently the federal government and state have lowered the right of way um, charges for for setting up telecom infrastructure, um, and I think that's a um, an important step um, in terms of you know enabling uh, um, enabling the penetration of internet and also improving uh, internet services to um, to communities, especially rural um, communities. Now, go you know go into going into a conversation around you know um, you know the, the labor market and uh, but despite the opportunities that the digital you know uh, economy pre presents, you know there are gaps in the gaps in our, in our labor market. You know, one in four Nigerians, according to the recent um, 2020 stats from, from the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, one in four Nigerians are unemployed. And one in three Nigerian youth is unemployed. That makes, that suggests that 63% of, of, um, of the youth population between ages 15 to 35, you know, are unemployed. And, you know, the recent um, um, answers protest already, you know, tells, they begin to tell us what, you know, can happen if we don't do something about um, rising unemployment, rising unemployment rates, you know. And this inefficiency is not, you know, is fundamentally is, is because job growth is not growing, um, in the same speed, you know, um, is, job growth is not is not moving in the same speed like you know young people are coming into um, the labor market. Examples suggest that um, from uh, from PwC suggest that within the last decade, job growth you know moved up by just two percent, but more than five million people you know joined the labor market within the same period, and unfortunately. You know, we have a higher number of women, you know, who are unemployed and, you know, not active within um, the labor market. If we compare Nigeria um, to, to other, um, you know, African countries, you know, data from, um, from the World Economic Forum suggests that Nigeria only captures 49% of, of its labor market potential, you know, and yeah, I mean, the, the, and the stats, you know, shows that Ghana, South Africa, and Kenya are doing way better than um, Nigeria. Although this might be because of the population, but it also means that, you know, we are not harnessing um, our population effectively and, you know, the opportunities that a sector like the digital um, economy presents. However, the ineffic inefficiency of, of uh, the labor market, you know, the list is not exhaustive, but it can be, you know, can be you know brought into three uh, um, three key issues. One is the gaps within the educational system because um, the education system is not providing um, demand-driven knowledge that helps people, young people, to be effectively socialized into um, the world of work. For instance, um, you know we also have a huge number of Nigerians who who are not even in school. And also we're finding that only one in four secondary school graduates, for instance, 
um, can transition into um, into the universe. And what this means is that if if only if about the hundred if, if about a million people graduate from secondary school every year, only two hundred and fifty thousand will transition into the university, leaving a forcing another 750,000 people into the labor market unprepared. And that is, you know, at the core of the skills gap or the digital gaps, gaps that we see um, in, in our education system today. Also, our education, you know, doesn't provide necessary tools, digital tools or even laboratory tools that help, you know, people, um, um, you know, see the real world in what, in what they are learning. There are also limitations in terms of, the interaction that exists between uh, employers and, and job seekers, and then also their limitations um, within culture and, and, and our policy and our policy making. And particularly, this is where you know the gender questions come, come to play. Patriarchy, particularly, you know, is the reason why um, many women, you know, especially in the north, are unemployed. And so, in trying to understand, you know, this, this skills gap. What we tried to do with the research um, was to understand the perspective from job seekers as well as employers in terms of what skills, um, what skills are in demand, and how, and what's the perception in terms of the availability of these skills, and then what jobs are in demand, and how, um, and to what extent are young people interested in these roles. And so we looked at four subsectors, digital marketing, software development, um, data analysis, cybersecurity, and, and, and uh, cybersecurity and networking. And we try to understand, you know, again, what, what, is, what are the skills in demand and how do job seekers perceive of their knowledge or ability to demonstrate the skills? And also what, you know, job roles are in demand and what's the level of interest um, from the perspective of job seekers. So, you know, not to take too much of, of your time, the findings show that the top 10 um, skills that, um, top, 10, top 10 skills gap are in artificial intelligence and machine learning, data science, identity management and access, data analytic, data and big data analytics, um, cloud infrastructure, UI UX, computer programming, your mobile development and penetration um, testing. What we also try tried to just want to be sure that I'm still online. Okay. Um, what we also tried to understand was the scale of demand, like I mentioned earlier. Hi, Femi. Now, yeah. I was confirming that you're still online. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, in terms of you know um, the jobs that are in demand, we found digital strategies, cybersecurity, um, CRM and email marketing, security engineering, security architecture, and data science to be in demand. But there is limited interest from job seekers in these areas. And job seekers are looking for um, people in this. There are other, you know, um, there are other, you know, jobs that are in demand, but there is, you know, enough uh, um, interest from job seekers in those areas. So just what I tried to do was just um, filter out some of the um, areas where there is, you know, a demand, a demand gap. In the area of soft skills, um, we, we were trying and thinking about the best way to you know, measure um, soft skills because many of soft skills in itself, it, the data is qualitative um, you know, in, in understanding. But what we now try to do was to use a rubric system to help to advance our understanding you know, and knowledge around, first of all, even how to measure soft skills um, um, and you know, where the gaps actually lie. Um, and so based on Jobberman's uh, um, soft skills training, um, we extracted the baseline information um, that over you know, 20, 22,000 young people took. And what we did, the, the, um, the 
the domains or the specific soft skills that we were trying to measure were personal effectiveness, work preparedness, communication skills, professionalism, emotional intelligence, innovativeness, and problem solving. And what we found was that on the average, on the average, young people have, all of those that took um, um, the assessment have an average score of 49. And what that means is that they are within the weak, uh, the weak, um, you know, they are within the weak um, realm of, of the scale that we're measuring. And the huge, the, the more important gaps are in emotional intelligence, innovativeness, and problem solving. And this have uh, one top, this, these skills in itself are the top three soft skills that you know employers are demanding. Some of the other um, um, soft skills that are that was not measured but mentioned when we did um, when we conducted uh, interviews with employers were in the areas of lifelong learning. Lifelong learning, for instance, is the reason why um, you know in one of the leading uh, um, what's it called one of the leading um, um, tech giants in Nigeria, you know, had to let go of some of its staff. And what we understood from, 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 from them was that um, a lot of, you know, their younger employees were not, were not um, moving along with trends in the digital. The digital sector is, you know, very, very, uh, it's, it's dynamic and, it, you know, it's, it's changing on a constant basis. And so if, you know, for those who want to be a part of the digital sector, they have to be, they must have the, the, the mindset of lifelong learning to keep, to keep up with the, with, the, with the rate at which the, uh, the digital sector, you know, is, is moving. And so lifelong learning was, was, at, was top of the chart as well as, um, as well as leadership. And that even comes in from a gender, from a gender perspective. Um, a, a number of the employers we spoke with told us that uh, that for, for women who are within who are in the digital sector, um, there's a tendency for them not to really, you know, understand how they want to play um, and you know the role they want to play and how they want to advance in the, you know a career within that sector. And so, what they find is that they're second guessing themselves themselves along the way, and so. That's perhaps one of the reasons why um, there's, a, there's limited participation, or that's one of the reasons why the, um, the digital sector appears to be, you know, um, male dominated. And so some, in going into um, details of, of, of the findings, obviously employers are saying that, you know, um, job seekers are, um, are not, you know, ready. Um, but again, COVID-19 has even expanded what it means, you know, to be and to be uh, employable as, you know, the digital, um, you know, skills gap or the digital literacy gap, you know, became, you know, very, very uh, obvious. And, you know, part of the challenge here is that, you know, young people, particularly from um, disadvantaged locations or contexts, you know, have limited opportunity to um, trainings and education that allow them to build, you know, digital skills as well as um, soft skills. Also, we are finding that more and more employers are emphasizing um, soft skills as well as technical as, as well as um, technical skills. And you know, this, the result is you know, in tandem with you know, growing evidence within the within the uh, broader um, literature. Also, the pandemic has required employers to expand their operations as demand for digital services increase, and more employers are shifting from an emphasis on certifications to practical tests. So, what this means is that um, for young people who want to get jobs within, you know, the digital sector, employers are le are becoming less and less interested in you know, what your CV is saying or what your profile is saying. They want to be sure that before you come into the organization, you are able to perform specific tasks. Um, and so, you know, they're beginning to pay atten more attention to um, practical tests and, and assessments. Furthermore, um, 
although the pandemic has, you know, impacted cash flow, and what we try to also do with the research was to understand um, how the pandemic um, is affecting, um, you know, businesses within the digital sector. And, you know, although the, the pandemic has impacted cash flow and capacity to pay salaries, employers within the digital sector are saying that they are less likely or will not lay off that 70% of those um, that we surveyed are saying the same thing. Furthermore, young people are aware, young people are aware of the deficiencies, you know, within the, within um, the realm of digital skills that are required of them, you know, based on, 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 the, on the evidence, you know, a lot of them even rated themselves as beginners on a lot of all of the skills that were highlighted earlier. But what we found was that there is very little awareness of soft skills among, amongst job seekers. Many job seekers don't understand, you know, what emotional intelligence is. They don't understand, you know, what innovativeness means. Many of them don't even know what it means to be, to be work ready, right? Um, and even the concept of soft skills in itself was, was new to um, a, a number of the employ a number of the, you know, um, job stickers that we um, engage with. And you know, this, you know, further, um, you know, emphasizes the need to mainstream, to mainstream um, soft skills. And I think maybe I should, you know, emphasize this a little bit. There's a need to mainstream the idea of soft skills, you know, from our educational, from our educational institutions. And that is also what makes, that what will also what make what will make you know our curriculum uh, uh, demand a bit more demand um, um, driven? And for many young people who are on call today, government has you know free soft skills training. All you just need to do is go to our website and um, you know um, register for free at no at no cost. So furthermore, young people are lacking in you know soft skills measure uh, measure like like I mentioned. Young people are. aware of you know the gaps within um their digital skills but not not so much of um their soft skills and then finally we are finding that social norms social norms patriarchy um is at the core of um you know limiting female um or women from getting into um work in itself and um, these are just some of the stats you know, pulling out some of the stats, you know, um, based on what employers are saying is the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on, on business. And I, you know, I, we thought it was important to, you know, um, to pull this out because a lot of the employers are saying that increasing partnership, you know, in, in increasing partnerships, um, has been one of the key things that has helped them to remain um, afloat. And this, you know, at the, this, you know, is the opportunity that COVID has, has presented. Also, because of COVID, they are expanding and diversifying, you know, they are creating new products and services, and, you know, they are also involved in innovation and disruption. And so while other sectors like tourism, you know, hospitality are experiencing the downturn, it appears that the digital sector, you know, is a bit more resilient despite the impact um, of COVID. And to just round this all up, you know, summarize some of our recommendations into three, um, you know, three thematic areas. First is the investment in, um, in human capital development. I would just like to touch again on, um, you know, what, what it means to strengthen education um, and support reforms you know, around curriculum that is demand driven. Um, and what this means is, is, is not just having the curriculum changed. You know, the, the transformation of our curriculum, you know, requires an integrated approach. Um, for instance, the Lagos government, you know, recently tried to um, upgrade uh, the programming language, you know, at secondary school level. And they found bottlenecks, first of all, there was a need to, they wanted to change because the programming language at secondary school level is basics. And but now the programming language has gone beyond that. And, you know, 
Python is, you know, is, is what is mainstream now. And, you know, basics was something that was used between in the 70s and in the 80s. And so the local state government was trying to, you know, upgrade Hi, the Femi. from basics to, yeah? Can you hear me? Hi, Femi. Yes, yes. I, I honestly think this has been a rich session with a lot of information shared. Um, sorry to cut you uh, or to cut in. I, I just wanted to just be mindful of time um, as we were just doing a, a, a time check. Um, so yes, okay. if you could just briefly yeah, this, this um, wrap up slide. this session. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is the last slide. So, um, and what we were trying to do was to, you know, move from basics to Python, but there, were, there was a challenge of training teachers. There was a challenge of, you know, available textbooks and also the challenge of, you know, why exams? You know the questions need to be changed. So, uh, an integrated approach to um, curriculum review is is actually very important. Also, we have you know emphasized um, on creating an en enabling environment, creating electricity, creating infrastructure for for the penetration and you know um, quality of internet service is also very crucial. And finally, you know supporting innovation, you know removing those policies removing those um, um, barriers to innovation and promoting partnerships um, is an important uh, um, aspect of recommendations that we are you know um, um, putting forward here. So these are these are some of um, these are our findings and some of the recommendations and like Amanda mentioned earlier, we'll be sharing broader um, reports with everyone after. Um, after this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Femi. Um, it's always difficult being that person who has to jump in when we are so deep into the data and sharing such rich information. Um, but that was an incredible session, Femi. I've learned a lot um, from understanding how the increase in mobile penetration could increase GDP by 2.5% to increasing internet to creating 44 million jobs. Um, talking through the different skills gaps that have come out. And I know it was difficult for you having to summarize um, the multiple pages um, in terms of your report that you put together for everyone and that will be shared. But I think this has been um, super insightful. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I guess it's trying to balance um, everyone's time that they've budgeted um, as well as the, 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 the rest of the agenda. Um, I think now is, um, and I guess I'll try and keep this one short because I think Femi has uh, mentioned a lot of different items, but this is essentially the part where we had wanted to go into the Q&A um, and, and there'll be a few poll questions popping up on your screen just to get your thoughts on a few points that were raised by Femi. But I think at this point, I'd like to open the floor. Um, we've been listening uh, for quite a while as an audience and thank you so much to everyone who um, has been here from the beginning and even joined as we've been going along. But we'd love to get some of your questions, um, uh, you know, regarding this report. And I think that will even provide Femi with a greater platform um, to continue answering them and providing more context. So are there any um, questions? Maybe we can take the first few um, questions, but well done Femi. And I can't wait for everyone to see the great work that you and your team um, have done uh, on this report. So maybe we can take the first um, three uh, to four questions. Uh, I don't know if people want to put up their hands or maybe um, unmute themselves, but I'm just trying to view my screen right now. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? And I fully agree with a lot of the comments coming in. Femi, very valuable insights, so insightful, rich content. I definitely echo the sentiments of our audience. So any questions from the floor um, regarding the report? And, and we have some poll questions that have just popped up on your screen. If everyone can take a minute um, to just fill them out um, for now. But it seems Hi, we Amanda. may have, oh yes. Hi, uh, good morning, Salami. Please morning. go so, for it. I'm just, I've just been listening in all the while and, and thanks for putting this together. Uh, Femi, fantastic work. 
I get tired when I hear these things, even though they are the truth, because we just need to get to work solving these problems and closing these gaps. But great work. Thanks for the great report. I hope you guys are going to share that. Um, I think the second point for me is MasterCard. I mean, I know there are quite a lot of avenues to engage with you guys, but what are your preferred channels of engagement? I think it would be good to share that. 10 million jobs is a lot of work. Um, how are you guys going about that? Uh, I think those are my two questions plus comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salami. Um, and as everyone introduces themselves, if they could just share the company they're coming from um, and maybe their role. I, I think for me, I know Mr. Salami, <laughs> CEO of Ruby, um, a great friend of Jobberman. Um, but yes, for other individuals, if you can mention it. And we've noted your question, Mr. Salami. So these questions can be both general, but also regarding the skills gap report um, as well. Any more questions from the floor? I see people are also answering our poll um, as well. So thank you for participating in that. All right, I'm looking at my screen on the right. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions, um, just in hi. general about everything. Okay, hi, Tolu. Hi, my name is Tolu Adelo. Um, I work with a company called Kusant. Um, so I came in a bit late, um, but I don't. I wanted to know what the skills gap was in terms of healthcare um, going forward. Um, essentially, essentially, after the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I know we talked a lot about digital, at least that's when I got in, but I don't know if a lot was talk, um, spoken around or was discussed around skills gaps in healthcare, uh, pharmaceuticals, and I guess the medical sector in general. So thank you for your question, Tolu. Um, just to clarify and to answer that question, um, today's discussion is focused on the digital sector specifically. Um, and the four um, key parts of the digital sector that Femi mentioned we looked at uh, was digital marketing, um, there was cyber security, um, software development, um, and I think there was one more aspect, but there were four components of the digital sector we looked at. So in terms of the healthcare um, industry itself, uh, the skills gap were not looked at there. However, we do know that technology does enable the healthcare sector, um, and, and we do foresee some impact of that sector within the digital sector um, over time. I hope that answers your question for me. Okay, All right. Thank you. Okay, so for now, I'll just read out some of the results from the poll questions um, while we await other questions. Uh, so one, how do you perceive Nigerian youth's employment readiness um, with regards to digital skills? So 33% of you feel that they're not at all ready. 64% of you feel that they're somewhat ready. 6% feel they're mostly ready and 0% completely ready. And I think even just from this poll, just shows us once again, that there seems to be um, a gap within the digital skills. And for us, we'd like to, I, I guess there's a session under the breakout sessions where there'll be a discussion on how do you actually address um, these and are there any initiatives or thoughts coming from the floor um, as we are all key stakeholders in the sector and, and all views are important. Then two, how do you perceive Nigerian youth employment readiness with regards to soft skills? 50% somewhat ready, 44% not at all ready. Um, so once again, 94% being not ready. Um, so I think I'm gonna close this poll for now um, and just check once again, if there are any more questions. Okay, I see we don't have any more questions coming from the floor. 
Um, I assume everyone is still digesting some of the information that Femi shared. Um, and I am also aware that we are running over time. Um, so I'll just give one more minute um, before we move on to the next session, which is the panel discussion. Um, and here I'll be handing over to Mayawa Ali. He's actually um, one of the, he, he likes to fight this one, but um, he's one of the managing partners of Traction Venture Partners. Um, and uh, he would basically be a moderator. They do a lot of work within the digital sector and we thought it apt to have him moderate the session. Um, but before I move on today, are there any more questions? Even if it's comments, reflections or thoughts, um, on the skills gap report, but even beyond that, on some of the points that were mentioned um, by Mr. Kasim and by Asata. And I think at this point, Asata, I'll just let you respond to Mr. Salami's um, question, which was MasterCard Foundation, are there any preferred channels of engagement um, for other people who want to contribute to the goal of impacting 10 million young Nigerians? It is an audacious goal. Um, and as he said, it's, it's not an easy feat. Um, so yes, I sat up, you can respond to that while we wait for other questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you for the for the question. Um, the, typically, the, the foundation would uh, conduct a series of research and diagnostics, uh, desk research a lot, um, but also uh, deep dive research in a country, in a particular country, in order to identify the areas of uh, uh, of engagement and identify areas of investments that would be relevant to uh, the, the challenges that young people face uh, and the challenges that the, the, the country also uh, face for economic development. Um, after having done that, we also do another level of discussion and consultation with um, with the with the ecosystem that's that's there, people who are uh, and organizations that are on the ground that are working on these issues, um, and uh, we have um, sometimes conducted discussions as long as like during one year, engaging in various sectors, but really trying to listen and understand from the point of view of organizations that are uh, that are grounded there. Uh, so we don't come with any assumption or any pre-made like uh, assumption in terms of how we should be working. We we really listen and we try to adapt our uh, interventions based on the problems that are raised by the very actors uh, on 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 the on, on inner country. And uh, following that, we. Um, we define the intervention. Actually, it's it's with you, with partners like Jobman that help us define the strategic interventions, and for which we invite just you know relevant partners, key partners to apply for grants um, uh, through our proposal system. Uh, that's basically what I can say in terms of engagement. We work with civil society, we work with private sector, we uh, we work with uh, government agencies, not not central government, but government agencies, public sector agencies, uh, in order to advance our goal. And indeed, um, you know, nobody can do it alone. Even us, with the amount of resource we have, we can't do it alone. We have to do it in a way that is highly collaborative with. Um, with with organizations that are uh, that are present that are close to the problem and that are more able to actually action the change that we want to see so uh, in the coming um you know in the coming year at the moment of course as you know with the with the with the pandemic we had to even you know we also had to adapt <laughs> as an organization and try to see uh, how best to support and build the resilience of African economies. And um, we're currently in that process and 2021 is going to see probably new approaches coming up, which uh, which were, you know, which were initially not, uh, not, not looked at, but now that are absolutely necessary. And for example, one of which is, is the, you know, the digital sector, even though it was looked at as a program, now it's become a, a very urgent, and needed priority um, in order to um, help us drive the uh, the objectives of the foundation. Thank you so much, Asata. Um, I, I I trust that that answers your question, Mr. Salami. Um, I I have. Uh, in, does that answer your question, Mr. Salami? 
Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Uh, I guess we can we can connect offline. The polls are interesting, uh, and thanks for the answer. I appreciate that, uh, from Azata. Um, the polls, just to comment that the polls, I think the first and the second need some type of grading and sort of like comment feature. But sorry, I think we can take that offline as well. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, so we have the last two questions under the polls. Um, on my screen and I'll, I'll share it now. I'll end the poll and then share the data. But just to let you know which of the um, highlighted subsectors do you expect will drive digital sector growth and investment in Nigeria over the next five years? Front runner uh, right now is FinTech at 63%. Um, Agritech coming um, just after that, uh, 55%. Um, E-commerce, 47%. Um, and EdTech, slightly behind that. And then Health Tech. Um, at 31 percent. Um, clean tech mobility um, lagging behind somewhat, but I think these are interesting results um, and it's interesting to hear from everyone your thoughts on what will be driving the digital sector over the next five years. Then finally, how has COVID-19 affected the outcomes um, in your business or industry? 62% um, of you said positive and negative, 21% said somewhat positive, 12% entirely positive, so this is actually refreshing and maybe it's because it's a digital sector, right? Um, and then 3% it's somewhat negative, negative and, and then 6% altogether negative. So I'll end the polling and I'll share the results. But I think at this point, if anyone wants to raise their hands, because I know a lot of you are on mute to say um, something, I'll just give us one more minute to take some thoughts from around the room, either regarding the digital skills gap or your thoughts on the digital sector um, before I hand over to Maya. Please feel free to speak up um, and let me know. Or to raise your hand as well. Well, uh, I Amanda, this is, uh, this is Aisa. I, I just, I, I, you know, we look forward uh, also at the foundation to, to have the report um, shared, disseminated across the board. This is all part of our knowledge and, uh, uh, you know, and learning sharing. And, um, and obviously, you know, the, the findings um, how would you put it? Well, somebody said they're always unhappy when they hear it, although it's the truth. But these yes. should be these should be really used for action, and that's really what we're looking forward to do uh, with uh, you know with organisations like like Jobberman and um, and sharing it also with others that are that are in the ecosystem, making sure we are addressing the pain points and yes. bringing in really systemic changes that, uh, that 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 are needed in order to to solve some of these. Uh, long-standing problems. Fantastic, Asata. We look forward to sharing it with you, um, Rotendo, um, Nonya, and the full team. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. All right, I'm going to stop sharing the results and hand over to Maywa Ali. Um, he is the managing partner of Traction Venture Partners. So Maywa, um, over to you. Um, and then just to mention that Maywa will be moderating a panel discussion with the following individuals. So thank you to all of them for joining us. Um, obviously, Mr. Kasim is representing the um, NIDA as the DG was unable to join us, but we also have with us today, Nkem Alozi, Program Manager Decagon, Bode Abifarin from uh, the COO of Flutterwave, Paula Wigwe, Business Manager, Microsoft Africa Development Center, um, West Africa specifically. Um, I think you guys are in great hands with Mayawa and we're all looking forward to hearing um, the outcomes of this panel discussion. So thank you, Maiwa. Great. And um, welcome to our panel. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for, for, having, for having me, Amanda. Um, so I think um, Amanda already introduced the, um, the panelists. So Barista Sodangi was standing in for the, the DG of, um, of NITA. Um, and Kem is the program manager for Decagon. Uh, Decagon is an organization that um, train software developers, um, and th uh, they have a goal to train ten thousand developers over the next um, over the next ten years. Um, and Bode is here of Flutterwave, which I think we're all you know um, everyone um, you know knows. Um, she basically is responsible for strategy implementation and organizational performance um, at at Flutterwave. Um, and Paula, just like Amanda mentioned, is the business manager for the African Development Center of Microsoft. 
So um, I think we hope that we're going to have a really um, interesting conversation, um, you know, talking on a number of the points that have been highlighted um, in, um, in the report um, and seeding the conversations that will happen um, in more detail in the breakout sessions. Uh, just to confirm that, um, you know, all the panelists can, can hear me, you can just uh, please confirm. Um, Barrister Sodangi? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, and Inkem? I'm here. Oh, okay, awesome. And Buddy? I'm here. Okay, I'm awesome. And then Paula? Uh, Paula, can you hear us? Okay, so maybe Paula might be having some connectivity issues. I think uh, we'll probably reach out to her um, in, in the background. Uh, but we will get started uh, with uh, with the panel. Uh, the, the, the first question that goes to Barrister Sabangi. Um, so first, thank you so much for, 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 for relaying the DG's message and really good to see, you know, all the well taught through um, initiatives that NITA is, um, is, is driving. Um, I think we've seen, you know, over the last, you know, two to three years, quite a lot of, um, you know, momentum, um, you know, in the ICT, I, ICT space. Um, and it's starting to sort of become, you know, front burner, uh, you know, across, you know, different levels of, um, of, um, of government, you know, um, both at the federal level. And, you know, we've seen some states, for example, um, in the wake of COVID, you know, reduce the right of way. Um, cost to, to zero and, you know, just try to, um, trying to sort of grow the digital economy, um, you know, in their respective states. But, you know, would be good to get your thoughts around, you know, as an ecosystem, right? Um, and, you know, all knowing sort of, you know, how important, you know, the digital economy, you know, could be to, to Nigeria, right? And, you know, the amount of jobs that could be created. How yeah. can we sort of continue drive, you know, digital, right, and sort of the digital ecosystem as a lot more front burner of policy, right? Um, and not just at the federal government level, but, you know, at every, at, at every level of government, right? So at the states and also at the local governments. Very good question. Um, and it's, it's, it's important that we start by saying that what well, we all know that um, digital economy is largely an enabler. Um, that's what it is primarily. It, it's to, in a manner of speaking, serves its own purposes, you know, um, around core tech and so on. But really, it's how it manifests and operates in other sectors that is the, is the ultimate buzz. Um, so what we need to do is really think about how do we infuse digital economy as a, as a, as a strand of thinking as a major plank in development of all sectors and all structures of government, you know, to ensure that we create those opportunities that are the demand drivers for skills and jobs. I see a concentration of, you know, all the capacities and all the innovation around certain sectors for good reasons. One, there's a lot more formality around finance, for instance, so you can see where FinTech is going, there's some effort around fintech, um, um, some demand around health tech, and you can see some of the traction, you know, and some low, low level activity around edu tech and so on. You know, all that, these are, in a manner of speaking also, um, lack of a, for lack of a better expression, I say there are centralized opportunities that just rise to the fore based on what had been done yesterday. By yesterday, I mean policies and sort of initiatives that are, that are on the way. What isn't happening, and that's where my real concern is, is that, and it's very limited from what we can do in, not completely, but somewhat in NIDA is, having to have every key sector infuse tech, not as some sectarial support, but as core driver in altering process and even the, at the delivery of services from the public sector as it flows to opportunities in the real economy. What I see is that there is an assumption that is erroneous by, by players in the sector, which is where I want to really um, anchor on is that we imagine and expect that we have this informed group on the other side, on the policy side, 
who really know what they should be doing. And that's an absolute mistake, you see. In other climes, I will trust many of the regulators at lo other levels, state, local government, to come up with ideas, who see the need, measure the need, and can respond to what society needs. In our case, there's a deficit, and we must take it that there is a deficit, and we must seek to plug. So if we want to drive employment and create all the jobs that the Jobberman report has identified and all the opportunities and complement the efforts of MasterCard and work with MasterCard and other stakeholders. And it's, it's, a, it's a big concern of mine that we're not doing enough in being able to add value to the conversations on policy. Mm. Those who have the products and those who have the skills and who understand must step up or they must be almost enable other players who must support how policy are crafted. I'm, I'm currently supporting a project outside government that is really trying to plug because I see, and I see the limitations sitting in government, I can't have a conversation with all local governments or all state governments, but I see sometimes even at the federal level, policies are being developed that you see may be deleterious to the opportunities to drive skills and jobs until you now explain what the implications are. For instance, I, 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 I'll invoke the Chatham House rules. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the finance bill 2020 and I'm worried about certain sections. I'm concerned. And I'm so that, that, that I mean, you, you I, for instance, there's a, the levy that will be on 10,000 naira transactions, auditor transaction. What is the implication for digital economy? We've simply excluded a large chunk of Nigerians when there's, as we know, there's elasticity when there's price sensitivity on an item between 10 and 20,000 naira, which is sort of the bulk of the items that are that may be bought on e-commerce platforms and driving SMEs that are digital. But when you have a penalty, because that's what it will be seen, an additional cost on that, people will receive and continue cash transactions and we will not grow the opportunity around. So there are all kinds of small things and there are a number of them, I can go into a number of them into the current laws that are being developed that we must attack. So we can't sit down, we, 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 we need to do more than speaking to tech as a sector, but rather coalescing as tech to energize other sectors so that there's a careful look at how policies and big ideas are constructed. Make no mistake in closing this part that what we enjoy today from FinTech boom and all the other opportunities, even Jobberman and so on, are opportunities that were created inadvertently or consciously by policy decisions that were made yesterday. If we don't pay attention to some of these things, what would happen is that policies will come to stifle. We should ask ourselves, why are there few exits in our tech ecosystems? Why is scaling such a big problem? You know, Why is repatriation of capital such a big problem as it affects what investments will be? What is deeming prospects? It will always come back to the macro issues. We must pay attention to macro issues that shape policy. We must do it together across all other sectors collaborating with tech. So that's sort of a very large you know, there are more specific things, but for time. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that candid, <laughs> really candid, um, candid view. Right. I think what I hear is really that, you know, uh, as stakeholders in the digital sector, right, um, especially in the private sector, then there, there needs to be a lot of really proactive, um, you know, engagement, right, um, you know, with, you know, the stakeholders on the public um on the public policy side um, and, you know, not just seeing digital as a siloed sector, right? But really about how it's, you know, it's an enabler for the broader economy. Thank you, thank you so much. I think just for everyone, right? I think, you know, those not familiar about the Chatham, Chatham House rules, just means that, you know, everything discussed in the house remains in the house. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, my next question is for is for Bade, right? Um, and I think I'll actually build a bit on you know some of what Barista Sodangi, um, you know, talked about, which is, uh, you know, a, a lot of the the space is where we're seeing you know a lot of the early growth in in the digital spaces, or you know you know places you know around like you know fintech, you know digital. Um, digital commerce, right? So I would want to get your thoughts on two things. One is, you know, um, you know, one just what are the spaces that are sort of seeing that early, um, early traction, but more importantly, you know, you uh, you see what Flutterwave and you know probably gives you a good overview of you know understanding 
where you know where's this adoption and growth you know coming from right especially geographically right and you know there, there, there are a lot of thesis that you know it's you know a lot of that growth is really in you know lagos and a few um and a few urban areas right so one it's is this true is this what you're seeing um and if yes right you know what are your thoughts on how we can also drive um you know the adoption and the growth of the ecosystem um, outside, you know, sort of the, the big urban area, especially, you know, some of those like marginalized um, and underserved communities. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Mayowa. Okay, so in terms of um, digital adoption and where we're seeing um, the growth, where it's fastest, um, I think there are many layers to this, but um, for the purpose of this, I'll stay on two based on what I, what, what I have seen and what um, data has shown me. So the first one is younger people. As we all know, younger people are adaptable, they are more amenable, they want to learn new things, and they have a lot of friends that encourage the use of um, digital. So one, I'll say younger people. So today at Flutterway, for instance, uh, we have um, a retail product called Bata. So when you look at the demography of the people that are more um, intuitive, they, they want to see everything that is happening, it's the younger people. Now, the second group that we are seeing in terms of adoption is women. So mm -hmm. we launched um, Flutterwave store sometime in April as a response to COVID. So mom and pop shops, small businesses um, that were traditionally not online. Uh, we created a store that you could, you know, set up a store within five minutes, just your own e-commerce online store um, in five minutes. And between then and now, we've signed on over 20,000 stores. Um, a great uh, percentage and proportion of those are women. And the reason is because they want, um, uh, they have a lot of things, ideas, creativity, and they just want something that enables them. So they want to be able to accelerate their business and they are very quick to learn. Um, I remember in the thick of the pandemic, when we started doing this and layering it with um, a lot of coaching and teaching, we saw people that were traditionally selling maybe in Lagos Island, selling lace. Before you knew it, you know, they were setting up their stores, you know, their children were teaching them. So a lot of women um, in terms of this adoption. Now, if you look at regions and demography, what we've seen is that is the areas that have better digital in, in enablement. So commercial states that enables you to connect easier and faster. So most especially states in the South, so if you increase adoption, that's you're increasing uh, penetration rate. Um, I think um, it was already mentioned in one of the presentations. So if you look at Ekiti and Lagos in terms of what they are doing um, to accelerate fiber access by removing right of way, you know, because it makes it less expensive. So we see a lot of adoption in the regions in the South so that it makes it easy for companies to be able to do all of this. Um, so, so to your question, the young women, and then in terms of states, uh, the South. Now, the other question you asked is, how do we widen adoption among this marginalized uh, community? So I have four things in terms of how this can happen. So the first one is the availability of internet infrastructure. So if the inf inf internet infrastructure is not available, you know, there's really um, nothing that you can do. So first, we need to find a way to get this internet infrastructure, just the same way we have seen some states in the South have done. What do we need to do to ensure that this happens across? The second one is subsidy is required. Um, if, you look, if, um, if you think about the amount of money you spend on internet, just, you know, people like you and I that work, you know, we have a, a stable source of income it's maybe almost about 100K to get the children going, get everything going. So I'm saying, you know, it has to be cheap. So government has to find a way to subsidize. And if th that subsidy is not coming through, we need to find a way to ensure that we're enabling the private sector to be able to do this. Case in point, I don't know how many of us know about Facebook. You know, Facebook has this free internet in particular areas. Um, government has to make uh, incentives so that this becomes easy for private sector as well to be able to contribute. So the third point is about digital literacy. So it's one thing to connect people. So if I use the example of the store as well, you know, I told you a lot of them signed up. So I, I've signed up on the store. 
I'm now available. People can access my goods. You know, before I was selling in Lagos Island, but people in the UK, Tanzania, Rwanda are now seeing my goods. Do you get? How do I ensure that I have digital literacy? So that's my next point. So in terms of digital literacy, how are we teaching them to be able to use this to the support and knowledge? Um, I'm a part of Faith Foundation, and I know that at Faith Foundation, they have this aspiring entrepreneurs where they are teaching them how to use the digital skills, um, teach them um, about the power that is in their hands, how to enhance their sales, how to, you know, beyond selling, how to do your revenues, all of those things. So the teaching has to happen. So it, it's not even about if you have like an internet enabled phone. You remember, you know, the USSD, there's no internet, but people like, you can see the adoption just because it makes things easier. People need to be able to know how to do it and resources, everything that they need also have to be taught. They have to, they have to know how to, to use this. And, you know, if you look at this beyond the businesses, I had mentioned young people and, you know, even though this was like an unintended consequence of COVID, a lot of children were at home during COVID. Um, they were learning online, um, submission of um, um, exams, everything was online. So we had young children that their brains are very am amenable. They are quick to learn. They are very creative, very young children now knowing how to use PowerPoint, knowing how to use MS Teams. So you can imagine if the penetration was available to every child, you know, every child had access to this sort of thing. You can imagine, you know, how this would have also helped because it's very important. They have, uh, they have very fast brains. So if we're able to, you know, leverage these two critical segments and, and be able to teach people, you can imagine how much acceleration and leverage we all get from there. Now, the fourth and last point um, is on security. So as you train people to get on, to become more digitally uh, adoption, digitally enabled, security is also very important. So for children, for instance, if you get them online, we have to be able to ensure that there are proper controls so that they don't get exposed you know, to, to things that we don't want them to on the internet. And then for people, for businesses, and um, for businesses as well, um, just from where I'm sitting, it's also things around, so people don't just come and fleece them. Uh, don't share your tokens, don't share your password so that they don't become um, uh, what, uh, open. So safety and security mm. will be one of the very key things as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, buddy. Um, very, very insightful, right? Um, I think, you know, really, really interesting, you know, insights that you shared, especially around, you know, sort of the adoption among among women, right? Um, you know, for, for some of like the, the commerce, um, the commerce products, right? And I think also goes to buttresses, you know, Barstek Sudangi's point around, you know, tech being an enabler, you know, for sort of like, you know, the broader, um, you know, the broader, the broader economy. Um, and I think, you know, also, you know, the, 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 the four points that you mentioned are quite, um, are quite apt, right? Around, you know, driving digital infrastructure, right? Uh, which is kind of almost like directly correlated to the kind of penetration um, you can get, um, you know, subsidies, you know, either sort of, you know, directly government led or true government incentives uh, that enable the private sector to provide those um, those subsidies. Uh, I think, you know, classic, you know, case in point is like what's happened in India, right? Um, where like, you know, Reliance Geo is basically like led like a, um, an evolution there. Um, and then digital literacy, uh, which um, I think, you know, you know, Femi also, you know, raised in, this, um, in, um, in the findings and really important, right, as all of this happens, right, you know, security and safety becomes um, even more, um, even more paramount, right, to make sure that, you know, that trust um, remains among, uh, among the users. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. Really, really insightful. Um, I will, um, so we'll take a different segue, right? Um, and sort of this question is for Nkem. Um, and so we've kind of talked about, you know, the local ecosystem and growing and, and, and growing that, right? But there is, um, you know, also, you know, that increasing opportunity for, for Nigeria to become, uh, to become a hub, right? You know, for, for serving markets, you know, beyond, um, beyond air, right? Um, especially with, you know, COVID-19 um, and the sort of like the rise of remote uh, of remote work, right? Um, so it would be good to get your thoughts on, you know, how do you think Nigeria can start to position itself 
um, especially in a relatively short, you know, um, uh, you know, there's quite a short window, right? You know, to really take advantage of this opportunity, right? So what are some of the, you know, practical steps that you think Nigeria can take um, to start to position itself as a hub for um, global tech talent? Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm just going to like, you know, jump on, on, on some of the things that uh, panelists uh, that spoke before me have already said, right? We have to expand um, the digitally enabled workforce, right? Decagon is doing that by, you know, developing, um, you know, work ready software engineers that can be utilized on engagements that are not just local, but outside of the country as well. We have a lot of engagements with international companies currently using the, the software engineers that we trained, right? So how do we do that, right? Um, Decagon as a company is uh, an, a merit-based need blinds company. What that means is that um, people that come into the program um, are the best, right? We have a 1% admission rate and 99.9% .9 of, of those people cannot afford to come to Decagon, right? So what did we do? We had to work with the federal government to develop like the uh, like a um, uh, a scholar like a almost like a loan like a student loan, right? So that they could get the student loans to come to Decagon and then go through the process of 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 investing in their future selves. But that took a lot of work. It took a lot of uh, efforts. It took a lot of convincing. It took a lot of um, cajoling, right? So we need more input um, from the from various stakeholders. Holders, holders, especially the government, to be able to accelerate um, the expansion of the opportunities in terms of the training for the people that we need to, um, to, 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 to put Nigeria on the map for um, software engineering and tech talent, right? The more highly skilled um, tech uh, enabled talent that we have in Nigeria, the easier it becomes to be put on the map for, as, a, as a source of, those, of that talent. And to do that, we're gonna need help from you know, not just private sector, which we have by, um, um, by working hand in hand with some of the uh, banks in Nigeria as well, but also from the federal government uh, as well to see uh, what can be, right? I'm burdened by what currently is. So that's one thing. And another thing is that, you know, I, I told you that Decagon has a 1% ad, uh, uh, admissions rate. Um, so I think the last cycle we had like maybe 6,000 people apply and we got like 50 people in the program from 6,000 applications, right? So what we're learning is that these guys are the smartest, one of some of the smartest people in Nigeria, but they still lack the fundamental soft skills to be able to uh, allow them to, um, to deliver for uh, clients that are not local, right? You have to have a unique set of skills, um, especially with this remote um, uh, workforce that we're currently in right now, right? So over communication is, is, is important because we, we're not sitting next, next to each other anymore. And so you, you have to even have even more soft skills to be able to clearly, you know, communicate, you know, issues and resolve issues and seek clarity and elicit uh, responses um, that is um, in the manner that international clients um, used to work, right? And what we're finding is that not only do we have to emphasize the, uh, the, the tech skills, which they're good at, but they're severely lacking on the soft skill side. So we almost have to like double up on the preparation and run a parallel program that is both technical based and soft skills based so that they can meet the, the, the requirements for doing work outside of the local ecosystem, right? So, so like in a nutshell, we need both. We need financing um, to expand the workforce um, and we need um, training, which we're providing. We need more decacons, right? It's because the more people we can put into, into the marketplace, the better for everyone. And then we also need to, to make sure that we're developing the soft skills that, are, that, that, that if you want to work in, a, in, a, in, a, in an international organization, you have to have to be successful. So those two combined um, and, you know, and, and the soft skills that can, can start earlier, earlier, earlier earlier on in the process. It doesn't have to, you don't have to wait to get to Decagon to start the soft skills training. That can start primary school, you know, secondary school, university, um, you know, cause it changes, you know, we have to change, we structure our thinking around um, with the new, you know, digital age, uh, our thinking around how things get done, how work gets done. So um, I think that those things combined 
um, would actually help to put um, Nigeria on the map as, uh, as a location for um, international work. Uh, because one, we have so many advantages. We're, we're English speaking. We're in a sweet time, uh, time zone spot, Europe, not too far from the US, uh, consistent with Europe. So we, ha we have unique advantages that even countries like India don't have in terms of our time zone and the fact that we speak with English speakers, right? So we have every advantage and we're smart people. So we have every advantage. All we just need is just you know, a little bit more support. And that's what I think. No, awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. So, you know, if I almost recap, it's really, you know, look, the, the demand is there. Right. Yeah. And, you know, what we really need to do is uh, Nigeria is really built that supply. Yeah. Right. Um, of of talent that can um, that can serve that, that can serve this demand. Um, and to do that, you know, one is, you know, just just financing. Right. Um, you know, it just allows a lot more people to get trained um, and create opportunity for just, you know, so many people who, um, you know, just probably would not be able to ordinarily afford um, afford um, afford this, um, you know. Um, and, and then also, I think, you know, and, and an interesting point that you make is, you know, especially as we seek to to serve, you know, markets beyond air then the soft skills even become more important, right? You know, how do you sort of like, you know, um, communicate properly, you know, how do you sort of like, you know, handle multi-stakeholder environments, uh, you know, that becomes, you know, even much more paramount um, for, for our software. Um, for, for, for our software developers um, locally. So uh, thank you so much. Um, again, um, really, really insightful. Um, so, I mean, um, I've got, you know, there are the, the more questions, but, you know, I also super mindful of time, right? And the fact that we're, um, we're at noon. So we will, you know, sort of, you know, wrap up the panel um, the panel session at this point and, you know, try to take a lot of the other the conversations into the, um, into the breakout um, sessions where we can have a lot more um, robust um, conversations um, and, you know, start to hopefully get into, you know, what are potential initiatives that, uh, you know, the, you know, all of us as stakeholders, but also like, you know, Jobberman and the MasterCard Foundation, um, you know, could, could facilitate um, as we seek to grow this ecosystem. Uh, so thank you so much to the panelists. This has been super insi ins insightful. Barita Sodangi, thank you so much. Uh, but Dave, thank you. And Inkem, thank you so much. Uh, Amanda, uh, over back to you. Thank you so much, Mayawa. And thank you to our panelists, um, Inkem, Bode, uh, Mr. Kasim. Um, I think you guys um, just made it even more real for us, right? Um, sharing your insights from the ground, if I can put it that way. Um, so thank you so much for that panel. We had to keep it short because of time. Um, but yes, I think now the next session is essentially going to be the breakout sessions. We've had a lot of communication in the chats asking which breakout sessions people want to be in. Um, and this was to enable us to slot everybody into the right breakout session. Um, as soon as I'm done giving an overview of them. So there are three breakout sessions for today. First one, creating an enabling environment for innovation in the digital ecosystem. Um, this will be moderated by Mayawa Ali. Um, and under here is just touching on points such as the regulatory environment, investments in infrastructure, private and public partnerships, um, which we know has come up as something critical for the success of the sector today. Breakout session two, investing in human capital development. This touches on education systems, training programs, and general um, uh, general skills development. And, and then it also extends to employment and gender dynamics. This will be moderated by Nisi Madhu. And then finally, breakout session three. Um, this is Talent Beyond Borders. Um, Nisi Madhu is actually from CC Hub, just to mention. Um, so thank you, Nisi, for assisting us with moderating this one. Then finally, Talent Beyond Borders. This is focused on employment opportunities for Nigerian talent abroad, remote working in Nigeria and exchange programs. Um, um, and this will be moderated by Adaeze Sokan. She is a director at um, Ventures Platform um, Foundation. Um, so yes, I think uh, a few people are still dropping their breakout sessions on the side. I think our team behind the scenes um, will basically now slot everybody into their different breakout sessions. 
So please look out for a notification on your screen. Um, and you should be shifted automatically into your breakout sessions now. So yeah, thanks team in the back. Let's do this. Hi everyone, welcome back um, to uh, the main room. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. okay, fantastic. So I know it feels like we had very little time um, in the breakout sessions, but I hope we were able to um, have a few discussions um, and, and come up with some insights that I, our moderators will be sharing briefly. Time is far spent, <laughs> as we say. Um, and I think if we could just have literally one minute from each of um, the moderators, and then we'll hand over to Hilda Kabushenga Kraga to just close off the event for us um, today. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think I, I will talk in sort of for the first breakout. Um, so where, where the really insightful conversation sort of, you know, touching on three things, right? The regulatory environment, infrastructure, uh, and private-public partnerships. Um, so on the regula regulatory side, I think sort of like, you know, three key, key points that came out were one, sort of the need for cross-engagement um, among agencies, right, um, of, of government, you know, so that, you know, people are talking to each other and policies are aligned. Um, you know, very linked to that is also sort of, you know, how we can sort of ensure that, you know, mandates are aligned between different government agencies, right, to avoid sort of duplication, right, of, um, of efforts um, and, and of policies. Um, I think a third important point was around how do we get a lot more technical people, right, um, on the policy side um, of things, right? I think there's a lot on the private sector, but, you know, how do we sort of plug that deficit on the um, on the public sector side, um, and you know it's you know for example you know people could go in full time or even like consulting capacity uh, to sort of like you know help on the policy um, on the policy side, um, and it's something that maybe for example like Jobberman the Massacre Foundation can try to start to facilitate and how do we sort of you know provide that you know assistance to to help to, to our policymakers. Um, on the infrastructure side, right, I think there were three key points. Right, one is you know, they're beyond like, you know, the digital infrastructure, like broadband, right? Things like electricity um, are very sort of like, you know, cogent, um, you know, barriers, right? To, to access, right? Especially in like, you know, less urban areas, right? Um, you know, as well as like education, right? It's also important. Um, but, you know, a, a good, um, I think a good example, right? I think that was shared was sort of the initiative by ATC, uh, you know, where, you know, they're leveraging, you know, the existing cell towers in communities that already have power, right, and already have connectivity, right, and sort of creating like this digital villages, um, you know, I think, you know, and also partner with Jobberman, you know, to sort of address, you know, um, you know, within the constraints that we have, you know, some of this, um, some of these challenges, right, and so, you know, there was discussion on, you know, how do we, you know, one, you know, scale up programs like this, but also broaden their scope of impact, right? So how can we, for example, now work to connect the guys who are coming to this digital village to remote jobs, right? Um, now that they have access to the infrastructure and connectivity that they need. Um, and then on the private and public partnership, right? Um, I think one is, you know, this is not just a Nigeria thing, you know, it's it's, um, it's something that's like it's, you know, in every country, um, just that collaboration between government and the private sector. Uh, but there was also an important point around the need to also engage the academia, right? Uh, and sort of like educators, right? Who also have a critical role to play, right? As we are sort of trying to grow this um, talent um, pipeline and also drive policy implementation. So I'll pause now uh, and sort of hand over to, to Nisi. Thank you, Maiwa. And so for us in the um, breakout session focused on investing in human capital development, um, we looked at two key aspects um, around technical skills and you know, employability and soft skills for young people. And um, around technical skills, there was a key discussion around the fact that we could 
work with existing education institutions because they have the numbers, they can um, be a healthy talent pipeline to feed into industry. And the fact that we need to um, include programs that are not just focused on you know, helping them build knowledge, but transferable skills, real industry skills. And some of the, some of the insights shared, what shared was the fact that you know, the projects that these young people work on, you know, final year projects or projects that they work on in school, how can we make sure that these projects are tied to industry needs, um, collaborating with private sector to, you know, for these students to work on the projects. And also how can you know, the lecturers in the universities, in these tertiary institutions also contribute to this sort of projects and also making sure that their research contributes to industry and works close uh, or hand in hand with, with, um, with the private sector. And then there was also the aspect of um, the fact that you know, young people already, this is something that's existing in Nigeria, the um, industrial attachment or internships, and how can we make sure that you know, these young people find um, good internship opportunities, but that also we support employers to be able to design effective internship you know, programs or opportunities that can you know, help these young people build the necessary skills that they have and be able to apply these skills um, um, once they get into employment. And then around soft skills or employability, that was also another key aspect that came out strongly. And the fact that, again, we can work with these tertiary institutions to ensure that that, that happens. Um, setting up career workshops in the schools, you know, counseling centers, and even just taking advantage of you know, student associations that they have and making sure that these young people, while they are in you know, the, the, the education system are able to get access to these skills and are able to prepare themselves for, for the workforce. I think I would put a pause there, Amanda, I realize we are out of time and hand over to Adeze Shokong. Thank you very much, Nisi. That was very insightful. Um, so like we talked about uh, talent without beyond borders and we looked at facts that Nigeria population is projected to be 800 million in the next decade. That's a lot of people everywhere. Um, but there's also data that shows that our population is our greatest strength and provides more economic benefits for, uh, for Nigeria. Um, so diaspora remittances in 2018 was, um, what, was $25 billion compared to oil that was $15 billion. So there's opportunity for, for talent exports. Um, to, to provide more economic opportunities in Nigeria. And we, and we discussed uh, four key things to enable this. One is um, look at their, their global skill sets that don't match the current skills development program. So everyone doing human, invest, investing in human talent development needs to ensure that there is a match between the demand for certain skill sets um, in, that aligns with the development programs that are uh, being held in, in Nigeria. So there's also need for platforms that project more data. Uh, so what Jobberman is already doing with this, this type of research work to provide more data and update the data on, on the global skills that are in demand, which informs the curriculum design and the types of trainings that are happening on the continent. We also talked about the need for government to, to market, to market uh, talent like the market oil, you know, so market talent, talent like another resource opportunity that can benefit benefit the con uh, country um, and have those high level interactions and sign partnerships on, on, on providing talents uh, to, to global markets. We looked at uh, also policy around curriculum design, I already mentioned that. So ensuring that our curriculum aligns with global market needs and infrastructure support. So if India is, India, India's economy, main economy is uh, championed by their human talent. Their foreign capital purely is majority is their, their human talent. So if we're gonna be competing like India and providing talent, then we need to do what India is doing. They've ramped up their digital infrastructure. We need to ensure that there's digital literacy, their computers, there's internet for people to boost their skills. And the curriculum uh, uh, development and, and training that is happening, is not just at university level, it needs to happen all the way from primary to, to, to tertiary and even in the workplace. So there's need for, for a curriculum redesign and infrastructure. Lastly, um, the more conducive business environment to reduce brain drain and to attract uh, foreign players. We mentioned Silicon Valley as a case study. Um, as the time Silicon Valley was starting out, 
big uh, automobile industries in, in Asia set up shop in Silicon Valley because of the talent, the engineering talents, especially from Berkeley and Stanford University. So once we have solid talents here and we invest in, in, in talent capacity in Nigeria, we, there's a potential to at, uh, attract foreign tech players. Beyond the talent, uh, uh, talent availability in the country, there's also the need to ensure there's basic infrastructure and business uh, uh, ease of doing business in Nigeria. So like lights and cost of living, like the first uh, moderator mentioned. And also the need for more exchange programs where the donors come in. The donors like the World Bank, the EU that are supporting uh, uh, exchange programs between both countries need to think about more exchange programs, but it needs to be designed in a way that supports not just the physical relocation of people to work in their countries, but also to support remote work uh, opportunities. So those were the five main points from our session. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Such rich insights. Um, honestly, for me, it's just clear that um, if these are the hands that the digital sector of Nigeria is in, then we are definitely set for success. Um, so thank you to our moderators. Um, for sharing those outcomes and facilitating these discussions. And thank you to everyone for participating. Um, I know, I think a lesson from us here is we definitely need more time to go deeper into all these different topics. Um, and it, it definitely makes sense to have even follow-up discussions even beyond this. I'm sure that was gonna happen informally, but I think it makes sense to even have follow-up discussions with various people. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Um, I think we've heard some practical solutions and I think um, for us, it's noting them down and having the conversations as a collective of how do we bring them to life? Because it's on us um, to do that. So thank you. All right, I'm going to hand over to Hilda to conclude um, the event. Um, yeah, thank you, Hilda. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you for everybody who's been with us for the last two and a half hours or so. Thank you for being patient. I know we're running about 15 minutes over time. Um, I think we've all had a lot to learn today. You know, we've had different perspectives from the Mastercard Foundation, from a representative from the government, from different people in the private sector and through the panels as well. I think the biggest learning is that um, there's still a lot of work to be done ahead. And just thinking about what we, the work we've done with the, with the soft skills, I mean, with the, with the skills gap analysis for digital, what we need to focus on now is, you know, the kind of solutions that would, would be impactful at all levels for young people in, in, um, in Nigeria, given, given the economy, given the different demographics and the different types and state and, and class of education that we're dealing with. Um, I think in terms of next steps, Amanda had mentioned this report will be shared with the Mastercard Foundation as well as with the, with the overall public. Um, and we look forward to hosting more roundtables um, in the next year as we, as we continue on this journey of, of analyzing the skills gap um, across the country. We of course also looking out for, for partners who are consistently looking for solutions in this digital space, trying to solve the skills gap, would love to, to understand um, and, and, and listen to more evidence of what works, you know, so that we can see how these things can be scaled and see how they can be rolled out in different parts of the country as well. Um, thank you once again for participating. I think that's it for me. I wish you a very good rest of your day and amazing holidays when they finally start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilda. Nothing else from me, you've said it all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time and have a great holiday.